the solar system, our cosmic neighborhood here in the universe. While it is quite big for us, it really is small in the grand scheme of things. Now, here alongside Earth, we have seven neighboring planets. This is Cup of Science Joe, and today I'm here to talk about the largest of them, the gas giant Jupiter. It was named for Jupiter, king of the gods in Roman mythology. And it really reflects this too, being the king of the planets here in our solar system. Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun. It is around 484 million miles away from it. And let me tell you, it is massive. In fact, Jupiter holds about 2.5 times the mass of all the other planets combined. For another point of comparison, it is 11 times wider than Earth, and if we tried to fill Jupiter with Earths, we would need 1,300 of them. It has taught us something very important too, and even led to the creation of a new division for NASA, but more on that one later. Let's talk a little bit about Jupiter itself though. As a gas giant, Jupiter does not have a true surface. So, you know, assuming we could withstand the crushing pressures, we could fall into Jupiter and we just keep going and going. We'd never really reach a surface like we do here on Earth. However, I do believe that there is a point in or around or near its core where even the elements and the gases that make it up are compressed to a point where they change to a more solid state. You know, this is still different from having like a crust like we do here on Earth though. For its atmosphere, it consists of hydrogen and helium with cloud decks of ammonia and water floating in it. This is what leads to its unique look with the dark orange stripes, which are called belts, and the lighter bands, which are called zones. These belts and zones flow in opposite directions of each other, east and west. It also has its iconic great red spot, which is a giant storm located on the planet larger than Earth that has been raging for hundreds of years. The storm is also very tall, extending down into Jupiter by around 300 or so miles, maybe 200, but somewhere between 203 miles down. The Juno spacecraft showed us that Jupiter has more cyclones as well. These cyclones are warmer on top and have a lower atmospheric density and colder on the bottom with a higher atmospheric density. They even have counterparts too, called anti-cyclones, which rotate in the opposite direction and are kind of flipped. They're colder on top and warmer on the bottom. Juno also taught us that Jupiter has pretty cool cyclones located on both of its poles. They are in polygonal arrangements with eight arranged in an octagonal pattern in the north and five arranged in a pentagonal pattern in the south. It was determined by mission scientists that these atmospheric phenomena are extremely resilient and basically remain in the same location. Jupiter has the shortest day in the solar system. And in fact, in general, the larger planets tend to spin faster than the smaller ones. On Jupiter, it takes only about 10 hours to complete a rotation. So its day is less than half of hours. The same cannot be said about its orbit, however. It takes Jupiter around 12 Earth years to complete just one rotation around the Sun. For its tilt, it is tilted like the other planets, but it's just by three degrees, basically meaning it's spinning nearly upright, you know, as opposed to Earth, which is 23 degrees, for example. And what this results in is it having more mild seasons than any of the other planets. 
Now, I mentioned earlier in the video that Jupiter taught us something pretty important. And this came from an observation that I want to touch upon next. Jupiter is home to the largest explosion we have ever witnessed. And it happened in the early 90s. In fact, it was March of 1993 when astronomers Carolyn and Jean Shoemaker, along with David Levy, discovered the comet that would come to be known as Shoemaker-Levy 9. Now, by the time it was discovered, it was already in a trail of pieces. The reason for this is because it had an orbit that brought it very close to Jupiter, and they also worked out that it had about a two-year orbital period. And so, during its last pass, which had been in 1992, it was ripped apart by strong tidal forces from Jupiter, leading it from being one comet to a string of comet pieces. This close pass would also be its last, as it was going to impact Jupiter on its next approach in 1994. This gave us about a year to prepare for observations, and it put NASA in an interesting position. They now had the ability to study a collision between two bodies in our solar system for the very first time. We studied it using ground-based telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Galileo Orbiter that was at the time en route to Jupiter. Even the distant Voyager 2 had some of its instruments pointed back towards Jupiter to help study the aftermath of this collision. The impacts started on July 16, 1994, and went through July 22, 1994. It was both magnificent and terrifying. The force these fragments hit with were roughly equal to 300 million atomic bombs. They created huge plumes that were 1,200 to 1,900 miles high and heated the atmosphere to temperatures as hot as 53,000 to 71,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So no joke right there. These impacts allowed us to study more about Jupiter's atmosphere, observe how it responded to the impacts, even learn about elements that were found deeper within it that were kicked up by the impacts. But it taught us something possibly even bigger than any of that. The fact that collisions could still happen in our solar system. And that if something of this nature were to impact Earth, it would be unstoppable by us and could very well be an extinction level event. This became a big part of NASA establishing the PDCO, or the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, that now tracks asteroids and comets that could pose an impact hazard to Earth and have also helped bring us missions like DART, the Double Asteroid Redirect Test, which recently successfully changed the orbit of a test target in the asteroid Dimorphos. This is pretty much the primary way we would defend ourselves against such an impact by either speeding up or slowing down its orbit, which would cause it to miss Earth, right? Because if they're gonna hit each other, if we make it go more quickly or we slow it down, then we can create a scenario where Earth is out of the way when it's going through. Though I do feel we should be grateful that we had Jupiter, the solar system's vacuum cleaner, if you will, available to take some of these hits for us. I hope you've learned something, and I implore you to step outside tonight and look towards the stars.